Okay, we're beginning. So we're going to continue with the exponential growth and decay handout. We're going to talk about uh, another application here. Newton's law of cooling, or Newton's cooling law, whatever you want to call it. So this is it's an empirical law, which means it's not something that you derive mathematically. It's something that you figure out from experimentation. So I don't know, maybe Newton was bored one day and decided that he was going to sit down and measure the temperature of his tea at various times. I don't know what was going on. He was going through a rough time at the at the time or something, but he noticed something very uh, peculiar, that the rate of change of the temperature of an object, like a cup of tea, is going to be actually proportional, which is a constant k, to the difference in the current temperature of the object and the surrounding temperature. Um, a lot of times, it's optional, but a lot of times people like it in a negative sign here, you don't really need it, because uh, you'll figure it out. But uh, here is where uh, T of T represents the temperature of an object at the time T. Time little t. Uh, K is a constant of proportionality. Uh, T sub A and B. It stands for the ambient temperature, uh, which just means the surrounding temperature. Temperature of the environment. So T is the current temperature, and it's saying the rate of change of the temperature is going to be proportional to the temperature of the surroundings. Meaning, uh, the hotter something is, the faster it will cool down, or vice versa. The colder something is, the faster it will heat up. So basically, this is something that you could actually measure and test. And the constant of proportionality k actually depends on the material itself. So a lot of times, um, we usually like to consider k to be positive. as it is related to some physical characteristic. Like uh, specific heat or the uh, surface area exposed to the sur surface exposed surface area or something like that. Etc. So you can actually choose how you want to measure your K in terms of some physical property. So we like to think of it as positive and so when you want to force your K to be positive for I don't know just aesthetic reasons I suppose uh, you need a negative sign here because that will actually make sense because you'll notice that if the temperature of the object is actually larger than the surrounding temperature, then you expect the temperature of the object to actually drop. And so you'd expect the rate of change of the temperature to be a negative number. Conversely, if this is actually colder than the surrounding temperature, you expect the thing to heat up. And so what you'll have is you'll have a negative in here, which multiplied by a negative negative uh, makes the rate of change positive. Uh, but in the at the end of the day, whether you remember the plus or minus sign, it's not going to matter because once you actually start plugging in specific values for a problem, uh, the number here is going to work out to what it's supposed to be. So wouldn't worry too much about actually remembering the plus or minus k. It's mostly there for aesthetic reasons. But yeah, this is something that you can figure out by experimentation. You can actually track how fast something is cooling down. Uh, by just measuring its temperature at different time periods. And you'll notice that you'll notice 
larger temperature changes the farther away the, the object is from the surrounding temperature. And this is called Newton's Law of Cooling. As you will notice, this, like what we mentioned last time, is what's called a differential equation. Uh, not going to go too much into the theory of those, uh, but like the other one, this is something that we can use separation of variables to actually solve. So what we can do, if we want to actually solve for t uh, as a function without having its derivative present, we can actually do that. Uh, notice that we can solve. By uh, that technique called separation of variables. So, uh, if I have uh, if I have t prime that. So if I have t prime is equal to this guy, now remember the t a and b is a constant. Uh, this, if I use the Leibniz notation, looks like that. And I can sort of separate the big t's from the little t, which is what separation of variables means. What's up? Uh, by dividing both sides by the t minus t a and b and multiplying by the dt. Uh, we would be able to integrate both sides at this point. And what's the integral of this side? It's a constant, right? The T, A, and B is a constant. Okay. The big T is a variable. So then it's just LN of T minus T, A, and B. And this idea of minus KT plus some other constant of integration, which we can solve for T by e in both sides. That is going to be equal to e to the minus kt plus c, which we know can be written as a constant times e to the minus kt. And so we can solve for the t as a function of time. It's going to actually be some constant times e to the minus kt plus the surrounding temperature. And this is the solution to the differential equation. OD just stands for ordinary differential equation. Anyway, this one does not have derivatives in it, so now you are allowed to talk about the temperature uh, purely in terms of the elapsed time. And you can find these constants here if you know uh, you need two pieces of information to find two constants. And so you doing that, we can actually answer a lot of problems here about how something is heating up or cooling down. So, moving on to the handout. Now we uh, know what we need to do for problem three. So problem three from the handout. The financial growth in the K1. Okay, so a thermometer is taken from a room where the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius to the outdoors where the temperature is five degrees Celsius. After one minute, the thermometer reads 12 degrees Celsius. What will the reading be after one more minute? And when will the thermometer read 6 degrees Celsius? So um, here we can start to, what's the given info here? What, what do I know so far? T is 5 degrees Celsius. T what? T A and B. Yeah, T ambient is five. What else do I know? T 
of 0 plus 2. And so here I'm measuring t is time in minutes. And big T is the temperature in Celsius. I know that the current surrounding temperature is 5 degrees. The thermometer was in a room of 20 <coughs> degrees. We're going to assume it was actually measuring 20 degrees itself. And it actually, when you bring it outside to the cold, it started cooling down. And after one minute, it hits actually 12 uh, degrees Celsius. So now, uh, the question is, what will, it, what will be the temperature after one more minute? So what we would do is they were asking us a problem about the temperature, a question about the temperature. So you can either use that guy, or you can derive it every time. Uh, either way, I don't care. Let's actually look at it as deriving it every time. Just in case, what you can remember is Newton's cooling law, the differential equation, but you can't remember this one. Um, so we will think of it as that differential equation with initial condition is going to be 20. And the initial condition at 1 is going to be 12. So what I can do here, this is dt over d little t is equal to minus k t minus 5. This means that dt over t minus 5 is equal to minus k dt. I'm going to integrate both sides. This is ln of t minus 5 is equal to minus k t plus c. And so this means that t minus 5 is going to be c e to the minus k t. And so this means the current temperature at any time is going to be given by this expression. Now I can find the C and the K by actually plugging these guys in. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, doesn't, uh, isn't the initial condition only T0? Why is T of 1 also well, this is the initial condition, but we actually need more than one piece of information because we actually have two unknowns in this equation. So if I only had one piece of information, we actually couldn't do much. Um, however, using the T0 uh, info, uh, this is equal to 20. Well, that is going to be equal to this expression when I plug in T equals 0. So that's just C e to the 0 plus 5. And that means I have that my C is 15. Using the other piece of information, TF1 is 12. This means when I plug in uh, 12, uh, 1 for T, the result is 12. So I know my C is 15, so this is going to be 15E to the minus K times 1 plus 5. And from that, I can find the K. So this is going to be, subtract 5 from both sides, I would have 7. And then 7 over 15 is equal to e to the minus k. So I can ln both sides. So I get my, uh, my k is equal to uh, minus ln of 7 over 15. So this means ultimately, my temperature is given by the formula 15 E that's right. Sorry, no. This means that my temperature is given by 15 E to the minus K, so that's uh, ln of 7 over 15 times t plus 5. So that is what I can use to answer the question. Now, um, one minute later, how do I find out the temperature one minute later? Plug in 2. Yeah, plug in little t equals 2. <laughs> so this means we want the temperature at 2 minutes. 5e to the ln of 7 over 5 times 2 plus 5 degrees Celsius.
And if I look at part B, when will the six? So the six here is, of course, referring to the big T. So I can just use this equation again. Once I find that equation, I can answer all sorts of things about this. So that would be 6 So, when we found k is negative, yeah. um, like the double negative makes k positive, like when you're putting it into the... Yeah, problem. the double negative makes this positive right here. Let's, but ln of uh, 7 over 15 is actually a negative number. Oh. oh so, so, so it is cooling down. That, huh? okay. So that's what you were saying before, that like, it doesn't really matter if you remember the negative or not? Yeah, it doesn't, because it's, it's going to work out. It's going to work itself out. Uh, this, by the way, is a positive number, so negative. Okay. So when I put in a negative k, it gives me actually the right kind of answer because uh, we expect this thing to be cooling down. So it should give us. It should look like an e to the minus something, which is going down like that. So that actually makes sense. And yeah, so it'll work itself out whether you remember the negative or not. I think I actually spoke about the theory there. So problem four, whenever you have a bank account uh, growing with interest compounded continuously, it behaves exactly like the exponential growth formula. So you can think of big P as the current balance, the little r as the interest rate, and T as the time in years. You can do that. So actually do four, we'll go through that together, and then three minutes is probably enough.
bank pays 5% interest compounded continuously. Suppose you deposit $4,000 into an account with this bank, A. Write down a differential equation together with an initial condition. The solution gives the amount in your account at any time T after your initial deposit. What is that? What's the differential equation? <coughs> Would it just be 0.5 times 4,000? What? 0.05 times 4,000. No. What is a differential equation? I don't know. I mean, it's P prime is equal to 0.05 times 4,000. Well, that would be a constant, which means your bank account oh. wouldn't be growing. Just P? P. Oh, okay. Right. So the rate of change of the account is proportional to its current size. It's growing by 5% of its current size per unit time. What's the initial condition? P is 0 to so That's what those guys are. So this here is called differential equation. an equation with a derivative in it, and this thing is actually growing, so it has to be like P prime equals RP, where R is going to be the rate of growth. In the case of a bank account compound continuously, that's just the interest rate. And uh, this guy is called the initial condition. That's what it is in the beginning, the state in the beginning. Now, move on to B. I think that was it. At what rate uh, is your account increasing when the balance reaches 6,000? <coughs> yeah, you just, this is just me, this is just asking the rate. Uh, this is P prime when P equals 6,000. That's just going to be 0 0.05 times 6,000, which is whatever. How long will it take for the principal to reach 5,000? So you deposited 4,000. How long before you have 5,000? Yeah. Uh, so 5,000 equals. All the initials, so 4,000, e to the 0.05t, rt. So this is where we're using now the equation, which is the solution to the differential equation, that p is equal to p naught e to the rt. And so what we can, we just plug those guys in. The current P we want to be 5,000, starting with 4,000, and that's the interest rate. So this means we have pretty much 5 over 4 is equal to E to the point zero five t or in other words, ln of 5 over 4 is equal to 0 0.05 is equal to t. So that, that's going to be it. Now in a differential equations class, you'll learn how to modify this equation to deal with other scenarios, but I'm not going to ask you anything more complicated than this. And so that's the, uh, the last thing you need to know for the test in theory. So we had a bunch of integration techniques, approximate integration, improper integrals, and this application. Did anyone do the test yet? Finished it? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So, feel confident? Like, I'll, I'll, I'll post the answers probably like so long or two. <laughs> huh? You didn't. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, probably maybe actually get through that by tomorrow. So, I mean, I have office hours tomorrow. Uh, so, if you have questions, you can see me tomorrow. Uh, we, I'm not going to see you guys on Monday because that's a holiday because we don't have classes. So, 
be aware of that. Um, so the next two topics I wanted to do, they're kind of isolated topics. I mean, one of them we'll actually use it later, but it doesn't really matter who I teach first, I guess. So I'll just kind of do whichever one I think I can get through quickest, which at this point is, I think this arc. I guess we'll finish this, I can throw an extra bonus problem in there on this thing. It's, it's not going to be too tough, it's just another application of integrals, believe it or not. Uh, this is just finding out the length of a curve on some integral uh, interval. So we have some curve doing as it do, whatever, uh, between say A and B, and we ask the question, how long is this curve? So uh, we pretty much do uh, what calculus taught us to do. Um, one of the main ideas of calculus, the kind of calculus way of thinking, is to, if you don't know the answer, uh, break it up into little segments, figure out the answer for each segment, and then add up all the segments together. That's the integral way of thinking, um, thinking in terms of infinitesimals. So what we can do is, given this curve uh, between A and B, uh, we don't know how to find the length of this curve, but we do know how to find the length of something. Uh, so uh, we're going to use that. In particular, we know how to find the length of straight lines. So what we're going to do is we're going to approximate this curve, which I've gone through, with a bunch of straight lines. Of course, the more straight lines we use, the better an approximation we will have. Uh, what you will notice is that now we can think of the interval that's created intervals that are created by these segments. So again, we're going to dissect the in interval. So I can call this, say, x0. That's going to be x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 all the way up to whatever this is, xn minus 1. This is xn. So now I can have like lines like that. So what I'm going to do, figure out the equation of each line, add them all together. And ultimately, what I'm going to do is let the number of line segments go off to infinity, and that will fit the curve better and better and better until it hits the perfect approximation. Um, so that's the idea. That's the calculus way to look at the problem. Um, what would that end up looking like? Well, uh, let's look at one segment at a time. At some point, you have a curve here, and you have two points that are connecting that curve. So that's, uh, say, your xn minus 1 and your xn, or something like that. One thing what we can do is we can call this uh, a delta x whenever convenient. Uh, we can actually call the distance here between the y's delta y, whenever that's convenient. Um, if I call my curve f of x, then this is going to be the difference f of x n minus uh, f of x n minus 1. So now we know by the distance formula how to actually compute this by the distance formula. I can find the length of this line. The length of the line is going to be equal to the square root of the difference in the x value squared plus the difference in the y value squared. Um, 
I can write this as the change in x squared plus basically the change in y squared. Um, one thing you can notice also then by the mean value theorem from top one. Anyone remembers what mean value theorem says? It means, well, let's start off. There exists a point C in the open interval such that. Huh? There is an average, but where does the average show up? Such that the instantaneous rate of change at C, in other words, the derivative of C, is going to be equal to the average rate of change, right? So that's where the average comes in. It's not the average of derivatives, it's the average of the actual function. And one way you can look at this is to say that um, i.e. for some c in the interval, what you can have is that the, F, the derivative at that point is going to be equal to uh, the change in y over the change in x. Or in other words, I can look at the change in y as the derivative at the point of time of the change in x. So what we can do here, ultimately going back here, I can replace this, uh, this L thing with delta x squared plus, here I'm going to put f prime of c times delta x squared. I can factor out my delta x. It is considered to be positive, so uh, technically, you get the absolute value of delta x here, and uh, but it's actually positive, so it just gives me regular delta x. And then I factor that out, and you see that I have f prime of c squared. So the length of one part of the line is going to be that. There's going to be at some c in here uh, such that that's happened to be true. Now, this c if I start uh, slicing it up in infinite intervals, this is going to keep closing in on that c. Eventually, that c is going to be able to function as the current x value that I'm looking at um, in the limit. And so, ultimately, by summing, so I take the sum of this expression. as uh, delta x is going off to uh, 0, or in other words, or number of subintervals is going off to infinity, in either case, uh, what we would end up with here is a bona fide Riemann sum. You'll actually get an integral out of this, and it's the integral of this particular function. The integral of the derivative of the curve the square root of 1 plus the square root of the derivative of the curve. And so ultimately, we end up with L, which is the length of the entire curve, on the interval AB. It's simply going to be the antiderivative from A to B of this formula, 1 plus <coughs> derivative squared x. So now that's, uh, that's a formula we know. Another application of definite integrals.
Now, one thing you should know, whenever convenient, we can uh, change the subject of the formula here. The argument is the same, it's just that you do the argument on the y-axis instead of the x-axis. Um, so you can also measure a length as 1 plus uh, the derivative of a function, this dy. So this happens to be the length of y equals f of x uh, on a, b, where this is on the x-axis. And this guy is the same idea. This is just the length. This is if you know the equation of the curve in, as a function of y. This is on the y-axis. So either way. So here, the idea is you have something that you're thinking of as a function of x. A and b are on the x-axis. I can figure out the length of that thing by doing this formula. Whereas if it's hard to find that thing as a function of x, if I can figure out what it is as a function of y, I can integrate between the c and d limits and find the length of it that way. So it depends on the situation. Yeah? The second one is f prime of y squared? Yes, it should be squared. Okay. Pretty much the same thing, I just changed from the variable x to the variable y. And it pretty much came from us uh, applying the mean value theorem to the distance formula. And then adding up all these little things. And that's pretty much it. So, uh, yeah, nothing else really to talk about there. Let's just do a bunch of examples. function y equals x cubed over 6 plus 1 over 2x on the interval 1 comma 2 y equals ln cosine of x on the interval 0 to Let's do the first one. A. This one they already solved for y, so I know I'm going to want uh, L is going to be equal to the integral from 1 to 2 of the square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx. That's the formula. My y is my f of x here. So now y prime is going to be what? What's y prime? <coughs> x squared over 2 plus um, 2 ln to x. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, we're doing derivative. Maybe oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one. Negative yeah. one over four x squared. Where's the four coming from? So then it's four and a half times. Oh, wait, sorry, the 4 is an extra digit. It's just. All right, so that's just a half times x to the minus 1. Do the derivative. It's minus x to the minus 2. You end up with this. Now, you want to say we're going to square that and then plug into that formula. The square of this is going to be x to the 4th over 4 uh, minus this times this which gives us a quarter, minus a quarter times two, a half, plus this squared, one over four x to the fourth. So, I'm going to plug that in. So my L is the integral from one to two of the square root of one plus x to the fourth over four, minus one half, plus one over four x to the fourth, and this is going to be equal to, you uh, can simplify this a little bit here, x to the fourth over four, one minus a half is plus a half, and then we have one over four x to the fourth, dx. Okay, how do we integrate that? x squared plus a squared? Yeah. By finding the quadrat now. You mean complete the square? Yeah. Um, technically you could, but I don't think that would help. Because if you if you wanted to write it in that form, it would be an x squared inside the square. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking you're thinking the trig sub, you're gonna have to need an x somewhere out here. Mm -hmm. um, another way you could do it, you could factor out an x squared from this and get the x outside here in that way. But there's an easier way. Mm -hmm. There's an easier way. But yeah, definitely you want to rewrite this somehow. Ideas? Yeah? Uh, that might actually work. There's something easier. Than this. It's there. It's there in the base. Like literally, I literally wrote down something on the board. That's gonna help you. <coughs> yeah. Right. Notice that. What are these guys look awfully similar, don't they? The difference is the middle sign. Right? Now this guy here is x squared over 2 minus 1 over 2 x squared all squared. And so that one over there looks pretty much like this looks over here, except the middle sign has changed. So it's like here at a minus b all squared, but over there at a plus b all squared. I can actually simplify this to x squared over 2 plus 1 over 2 x squared all squared uh, by picking up on that pattern. pattern. Dx. Okay, so now we can simplify this. What does this simplify to? Just drop the square root and then x 
cubed over 6? In this case, yes, but uh, you have to be careful about doing that in general, because technically what you would have is absolute value signs here. Right? We take the square root of a square. So, yeah, you can kind of cancel these, but you have to remember when you take the square root of a square, you can get absolute values. However, in this case, that's clearly positive, whatever's on the inside. So you can't ignore it here, but you can't always ignore it. So you should be aware of that. Um, in this case, we can ignore it because the inside is positive. Okay. So essentially now, I just have to integrate that, which uh, shouldn't be a big deal at this point. I mean, after all the crazy integrals we've been doing, right? So. If the inside wasn't positive, could you do anything about it? Then you might have to break up the integrals. Oh. Right. Remember, so when the when the inside is negative, the absolute value is going to return the negative of that thing, mm -hmm. and when it's positive, it's not going to do anything. So you might have to break up the integral over where it's positive and negative. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you just change the sign on on the uh, correct integral. So here. This is going to be a half times x to the minus 2. You add 1 to the power, you get x to the minus 1 divided by the new power. So you get that between 1 and 2. So you plug in 2, you're going to get 8 over 6 minus uh, 1 over 4 minus, you plug in 1, you get 1 over 6 minus 1 over 2. What does that give you? That's 7 over 6 plus 1 over 4. And that's going to be. Put that over 24. And 4 times 7 is 28. Huh? What did you say? <coughs> 34? I mean, you can reduce that total. Yeah, but every now and then this kind of thing happens um, when you have these ugly integrals. So we'll look out for tricks like that. Sometimes in actually working something out, you can take advantage of a pattern that you will see. Sometimes adding one does that. Questions on this? So the actual, you, it's just a matter of doing the formula. So the, 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 the hard part here, quote unquote, is actually computing the integral, which at this point, if I give you any integral to compute, you should be able to do it. I don't think we're going to do many more integral techniques. So I'll tell you what, I will give you 10 minutes to do the other two. And then we will wrap up. And then I might throw a, an extra bonus problem on, on this stuff. Find the length of this on this interval. Should know how to do that. Okay, let's begin. Let's go through them. D. Uh, what do we do here? Find y prime. Okay, and that is one over cosine. It's negative tangent squared x. Well, it's negative tangent x, right? Yeah. Y prime. Oh, yeah. And so now, when you square that, you throw in the length of is going to be sorry, four to square root of one plus square of that, it's going to be tangent squared x, uh, dx, and 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared, so that's the square root of secant squared. So, technically that's the absolute value of secant, but secant is positive on 0 to pi over 4, so you can't even ignore the absolute values. Right, because secant is just 1 over cosine, and cosine is positive on that interval. Uh, so yeah, we can just integrate secant, and we get what? Absolute value 
Zero power over four. So that is just ln of secant of pi over four plus tangent of pi over four minus minus uh, ln of secant of zero plus tangent of zero. Okay. Ln uh, secant of pi over four is going to be what? Well, square root of 2, right? Because cosine of pi over 4 is radical 2 over 2, or 1 over radical 2, and then the secant flips out, so you get radical 2. Tangent of pi over 4 is 1. Uh, secant of 0 is 1, because cosine of 0 is 1. Tangent of 0 is 0, so that's just ln of 1, so that is just 0. So that's the answer here. That's the length of the curve in whatever units you're measuring your, your thing. Yeah. 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 Okay, what did we do for C? That's the average rate of change. Yeah. It's not the same as the derivative. The derivative is the instantaneous rate of change. So then you need Yeah, but even if you get an implicit, how are you going to plug that in? That's what we get stuck. Well, if you find a value for x based on minus uh, and Sure. So x is equal to, it's going to be the square root of this guy. Now, plus or minus, but is it which one? Now, I know my x is between 0 and 8, so I'm going to think of the positive one. I want actually the positive radical, since x is in uh, 0 to 8. So it's a positive number, so I'm going to ignore the negative radical on this interval. And so I just have that. So basically now I have x is equal to y minus 1 to the 3 over 2. Is something we can do? So I'm thinking about this as a function of y. Which means now I need the limits on the y-axis. What would the limits be on the y-axis? Uh, if x equals 0, uh, what is the y going to be? Y equals 1. Y is going to be 1. Plug in 0 here, solve for y. Uh, if your x equals 8, what is the y going to be? 5. 5. Alright, because 5 minus 1 is 4. 4 to the 3 over 2 is actually uh, 8. So I can actually write this in terms of y. So my length is going to be an integral from 1 to 5 of the square root of 1 plus this squared. And this is why I would prefer to solve for the x as opposed to the y, because now when I square this, it gets rid of the, uh, the actual uh, fraction in the power. So it's going to just be y minus 1 cubed. Isn't it x prime? Oh, sorry. Pressure? Yes, yeah. we have to find the derivative. So x prime now is going to be 3 over 2 times y minus 1 to the subtract 1, 1 over 2. And that, I plug that in. Yeah, thank goodness it wasn't the other one, because that would be very hard. So uh, L is going to be 1 up to 5 of the radical of 1 plus this squared 9 over 4 times y minus 1 dy. So that's going to be 1, 5 radical. I guess it's going to be 1 minus 9 over 4. So it's going to be 9y over 4. And 1 minus 9 over 4 is going to be minus 5 over 4. 
Yes, we can look at that as one half times one to the five nine y minus five. How do I integrate that? The rank of nine y minus five. <coughs> So that's going to be that to the half, you would use a u substitution. It's going to be 9y minus 5. Uh, you're going to add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, but then you have to multiply by a 1 over 9 because of the substitution. Then we have the 1 half left here. So we have that. So we have 1 over 27 times. <laughs> Nine times five minus five to the three over two minus nine times one minus five to the three over two. This is one over twenty seven. That's eight times five. So that's forty to the three over two minus. That's uh, 9 minus 5 is 4 to the 3 over 2, that's 8. So that's the length of this one. You could have also solved for the y by just taking the cube root of both sides and bringing that over. That probably wouldn't actually be that bad either. But uh, I just figured it's easier to solve for the x because I get the, the half powers. Where when I swear I can get rid of it. Stop there. Next time I see you will be the moment of truth, unless you see me during office hours tomorrow. Let's see you guys next week.